So I want to start by just thanking Pat Masters, who is a force of nature and did an extraordinary job pulling this panel together. So thank you, Pat. So I have to start by telling a little story. Um, I went out to dinner last night with my man and with a very, very dear friend, David Kirkhoff, which meant that I really didn't eat and stress the whole time, and I'm probably still hungry, as many of you guys can imagine. Um, and we had one of those conversations that spans a million topics. We're talking, you know, miles per minute. And a couple topics come up that I thought were fascinating. One was the idea of music and the power of music to really connect us and to sort of transcend generations, to transcend stages of life, to transcend nations, really, to connect us as humans, and most importantly, to make us feel better, right? Music sort of lifts us up. And then another topic of conversation was just what was going on with all of us, and there were lots of updates, and I shared some stuff that, has, that I've been thinking about a lot, sort of struggling with, worrying over. And on the way home, I got into the car with my man, and I think I was probably exuding like a contemplative, not necessarily somber, but very sort of intense state. And I think he had ideas of being romantic. So I could see him sort of like, he's like, what will I do to sort of shift this mood that she's in? So he said, I'm going to play you a song. And it's by Pearl Jam. It's their new song. And so in my head, I'm like, I am not a Pearl Jam kind of gal. I want to be because I think cool people listen to Pearl Jam, but I'm more, you know, ABBA. You can judge me for this. Or LL Cool J or Gordon Lightfoot or Top 40. But I was like, he's my man and I'm madly in love with him, so I'm going to listen to it. And it did, for me, exactly what we had been talking about at dinner, which it sort of wormed its way kind of into my soul, made me feel less vulnerable, less alone, less nervous, sort of filled me with this sense, reminder, of how beautiful life is and what a gift it is to be alive. So I woke up at 3.30 this morning, which is when I always wake up to worry about things, and I was thinking hard about how to honor this incredible panel, and as I lay there, I realized that what he had done for me essentially was write me a prescription. And the prescription was a song. And what the song did for me is what we in the healthcare space are working so hard to do for everybody out there, right? To connect, to make you know that you are not alone, that you are supported, to feel inspired, to feel that you can, you can get better, that you are empowered, that you are invincible. And I was also thinking about how far we often are from that reality. And that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. And we're going to do it in a way that's a little bit different. We're trying something new. This is Pat's brainchild. I love wherever she has gone. Oh my god, she's run off out of fear for what I was going to say next, which is it might not work. This might not work. But that's what we all have to try in the healthcare space right now. We have to try new stuff. And it doesn't work, then we'll all learn together. And I feel like this is a community of friends, so let's give this a shot. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go down this panel. I'll introduce you guys in a second. And everyone's going to have two minutes. And we're going to be very tight with time. Two minutes to give an overview of what they think basically stinks the most in the healthcare system from their unique perspective. And then we're going to have Pat and Larry take more time to sort of hello, hello, respond and give more commentary. And then we're going to open it up. We're going to open it up for the panelists to ask each other questions. We've got questions we've been collecting from all of you ahead of time. And we'll give a chance for people to tweet in any questions that they have. We're not going to have people roaming around with microphones because what we've learned, all of us, I know I do this, is when you're given a microphone at a conference, you usually ask a question in the form of short speech. I heard someone describe it that way the other day, and it's very accurate. So if you have questions that you want to ask, tweet it to at Adrain or at Eliza Corp. And Lee, who is sitting up front, will be running up questions for us. So with that, I want to quickly introduce the panel. So we've got sitting immediately to my right here, Alicia Cole. And wave your paddle when you see it. I'll explain the paddles to you guys in a second. This is so we can beat each other if we disagree. Alicia is a founder of the Alliance for Safety Awareness for Patients and the survivor of a hospital-acquired infection. She's really also serving on this role as the voice of the empowered patient who is working diligently to change healthcare. To her right, we've got Judy Flynn, who's a nurse. She's the vice president of patient care quality and the compliance officer at Partners Healthcare at Home, working with home healthcare. She's really here representing the voice of the nurse, but also the voice of the patient in their natural habitat, I'll call it, out in the wild. 
We've got Rebecca Oni, who is a founder and CEO of Health Leads. For those of you who don't know, they, Health Leads is really known for pioneering what I'll call a very unique approach to connecting patients to the basic resources they need to be healthy. This could be food, heat, safety. And she's another voice, I think, for the reality that so many people face out there. And then we've got Joan Kennedy, who is the SVP of Consumer Health Engagement for Cigna, and is working sort of across the ecosystem with partners, with executives, um, with their key stakeholders to bring the brand philosophy of Cigna, which is to treat an individual as a whole person, to life. And for those of you who don't know Joan, she has made a long career of shaking things up and trying very, very different approaches to genuinely engaging people in their health in a way that makes a difference. And so she's going to be representing the voice of the health plan. And then we have at the podium our doctor and our patient, and they'll be the ones who are primarily facing off today. We've got Dr. Lawrence Cohn, who's a pioneering cardiac surgeon and longtime professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School, who's performed 11,000 heart surgeries, maybe for some of people in this room. And he has probably won at least one award for at least each person in here, so very esteemed. Um, I would also add that he appears to be our token male. So we can all, we can tease him about that as we go. Um, and then next to him is Pat, who is a patient advocate. She's an author, she's an industry advisor. She writes, speaks, reads, thinks about patient engagement so much that as she said to me very quietly, she thinks her family doesn't want to hang around with her anymore. They're sort of sick to death. I think that's probably true for all of us on some <laughs> level. Um, she also has a long record of being able to engage people in active dialogue, and that's really the goal today. So here's what we're going to do. We'll do two minutes for each, then six minutes and six minutes, and then we're going to open it up for discussion. Remember that you can treat your questions, and then as we're having the active dialogue, folks will wave their panel, paddle if they want, paddle if they <clears> want to <throat> Talk, so we don't have to, no one needs to feel like they have to answer, they'll just answer if they want to. So with that, will you take it away for us, Alicia? All right. Great. So the question is, uh, what do you think stinks in healthcare and what could make it better? Well, our healthcare system is home to some of the greatest technological advances and most cutting edge procedures in the world. But unfortunately, two million patients a year get hospital-acquired infections during the course of receiving that care, and I think you just heard something about that in the last presentation. I was one of those patients. My two-day hospital stay for fibroid removal turned into two months in the, in the hospital, six additional surgeries, almost having my left leg amputated, five months of hyperbaric oxygen chamber treatments at UCLA, a month, a year and two months of twice a day home health care nurses, um, three years with an open abdomen being packed every day, and for the last seven years I've had at least two doctor's appointments a week every week, including physical therapy before I left to come here. I'm one of the lucky ones, can you believe that? Because Every year, almost 1,000 people die from hospital-acquired infections. And those are numbers from 1999, the IOM report. Last month, a new study was published in the Journal of Patient Safety that estimates that now the numbers of medical harm has reached 440,000 people a year who die from preventable hospital-acquired infections and medical errors, mothers, daughters, sisters, brothers. We've known since 1847 that hand washing is the number one way to prevent the spread of hospital-acquired infections. We also have evidence-based best practices. And as you can see from the picture in the top, that's me after my third operation of a multi-drug resistant cocktail of infections, I'm not in contact isolation. So we see that we're not always adhering to those things. I think in order to fix health care, we need to work on ways to engage our providers. And then we also need to facilitate adoption of evidence-based best practices, adoption of new innovations, and adoption of new technology that makes health care safer and saves lives. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia. Okay, Judy. So Dr. Berwick said it very well this morning when he said that the majority of healthcare occurs outside of the hospital. 
And yet when you look at how we're training our healthcare clinicians, they are being trained to take care of patients in an acute care setting. So from a nursing perspective, the statement is, or the motto from a nursing school is, we're training them to be nurses at the bedside. Well, that would be nice if it was your nice comfy queen or king size bed in your lovely bedroom, but it's not. It's that awful uh, small rubber bed with uh, side rails that we're teaching people to provide care. And so I think that what we're doing is we're really perpetuating a very, very old, old view of what healthcare is. And I think that the first place that we need to look is not only to change our current practitioners, but start with all of those practitioners that are coming out of school and train them very, very differently. The second thing I think that is really a problem is um, we talk about care teams, but when you think about that structure that I just explained, then what is a care team? It becomes a care team that's in the surgical suite, or a care team in your hospital room, or a care team in your, your physician's office. But it's not a care team that is taking care of all of you. And I, we've heard some of the speakers today talk about, you know, the, the uh, patient's family and the informal caregivers that provide so much of the care, we have to bring them into it. And then the other thing is doing and labeling. We do health care. Um, you know, we do things to people rather than involving them in the care. And then we label people. So if I go to the doctors and my BMI is high, I'm labeled, now I'm, I'm a number, I'm labeled as an obese patient. I'm part of an obese patient population. If I go and go to uh, Weight Watchers, I'm a client for Weight Watchers, and they're going to understand and want to find out what motivates me and what's important to me. And if I go to the gym and have a gym membership, I'm going to become a consumer. So I think we need to change what the labels that we use. Great point. Rebecca? So uh, Health Aids was born of conversations with physicians about this question of what stinks in healthcare. And what they um, basically said is, you know, every day we have patients who come into the clinic, uh, presents with an asthma exacerbation, but, um, you know, and I prescribe controller medication, but I know that the real issue with this patient is that there's no food at home. I know the real issue is that they're living in a substandard apartment with, uh, filled with asthma triggers. And I don't ask about those issues because there's nothing I can do. They'd say, I have 13 minutes with each patient. Patients are piling up in the clinic waiting room. I have two social workers for 24,000 patients. And I think this really echoes the disconnect between patients' expectations and physician and other providers' realities. So there was a study done at Hopkins that showed that eight of 11 patients expect to be able to talk to their physician about their social needs. But the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation did a survey last year of about 1,000 primary care physicians and pediatricians in which eight out of 10 physicians said that addressing patients' social needs was as important as addressing their medical needs. But eight out of 10 also said that they didn't feel confident in their capacity to address those needs. So when we think about population health, primary care transformation, patient-centered medical home, we're probably not going to be able to make any of those things real unless we account for the realities of patients' lives. Um, a few weeks ago, Art Gianelli, the CEO of NASA University Medical Center, said to me, you know, I can, um, I can pull every lever against clinical care improvement, but I'll never be able to deliver the results that CMS expects of me if I don't have the tools to be able to wrap my arms around the realities of my patients' lives outside the four walls of the clinic. So Health Lead's model is really around enabling physicians, nurses, and other healthcare providers to prescribe basic resources like access to healthy food, safe housing, heat in the winter, the same way they'd prescribe medication. Patients then take that prescription to Health Lead's desk in the clinic waiting room where we have a core of well-trained and well-supervised college student advocates who work side by side with those patients to connect them to the existing landscape of community resources and public benefits. So uh, last week, for example, we launched at Mass General here, and now the physicians in that clinic and the patients can have a conversation together about not just what the patient needs to get healthy, but what they need to be healthy to not get sick in the first place. Thank you, Rebecca. Joan? 
So uh, we spend a lot of time talking about what, uh, how do we improve health or how do we uh, get at the needs of a member. And I think what happens uh, is that we talk about aspects of their health, right? But let's just say we'll call this person Olivia. We're, we, our intent in the community, whether you're a health plan or an advocate or a physician community or a hospital, is to take care of Olivia. But as David talked about, it's difficult, right? So then we start to say, well, let's break it up a little bit. You know, I'm in the technology field. I'm going to create a couple apps to help her with her nutrition, or I'm going to help her walk. Um, in the medical field, we say, well, you know what? We're going to specialize, and we're going to just deal with her cardiac disease, or we're just going to deal with her diabetes, and we're going to create specialty centers for her, and we're going to create specific disease management programs at the health plan. And then we start to talk, well, we want to do some more around health and wellness, and the, you know, the government's involved, and then the employers want to create these programs, and we're going to create special programs over here for her. And then we talk about her diabetes and how we're going to help her with her diabetes. And then we want to look at her adherence, so we're going to give her a bunch of devices to, to look at her adherence and send her texts on medication compliance. And then we're going to ask her to wear a bunch of things to, to assess how she's doing. And I think what we've all done with good intent is actually created a very fragmented, um, non-user-friendly environment, whether it's through benefit designs and the structures that we create, or through how we fragment care and how we deliver it, or in how we create very fractionated sets of technology to support it. So I think if we're going to solve the problem, and we've got to go back to sort of what David said, it's not easy, right? There's many variables that make an answer um, holistic for a person, and we've got to go back to that person and the entirety of their life and solve that problem and bring that fractionalization together to help Olivia live better. Joan, that's great. Thank you. Pat? I think oh, no, Dr. Cohn, yes, please. Oh. So it's only four against one instead of five against one. <laughs> We're just, she's going to back clean up. That's okay. Well, all of you have pointed out some terrifically important points. Let me, uh, this may not have any special order, but let me just talk about it. First of all, as far as the infection after surgery, there is no procedure, there's no intervention, there's no operation in any facet of medicine in the entire universe that has zero risk. There, I mean, you can go to your, get a haircut, the barber could cut your ear off, you know. Um, so it, the patients sometimes don't understand that, that there's not zero risk in any procedure that occurs in a, in a hospital or a doctor's office. Having said that, however, we should do everything possible to reduce these infections and reduce these kinds of uh, situations. Certainly in our hospital at the Brigham, we have this hand, this hand wash, hand cleansing campaign, and if a doctor does, as goes to an ICU and is seen by the, the ICU nurse not cleansing his hand before he or she goes into the room, they are called out. And if you keep doing it repeatedly, you may have to take a break from your practice for a while because this is a very, very important thing. If, however, this is related to inappropriate sterilization of the equipment that uh, may have happened in your case, that is a no-brainer that the hospital should, A, apologize, and B, should recompensate the patient, the hospital bill, and any expenses out of pocket that they have. And sometimes these I are gross things that can't. I wish you was my doctor. Can't. What's that? I wish you had been my doctor. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't I thought you said lawyer. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, a second item, so that, that's the second item that a lot of you uh, folks have mentioned, which we believe in very strongly, at the, I believe in very strongly at our medical school at, our, at the Brigham, is the service line concept. And, uh, a few uh, years ago, I, I talked to a, a retiring dean at Harvard Medical School, and I said, Dean, you know, we've had the same model at Harvard Medical School since we started in 1782. We have a chief of surgery, a chief of medicine, a chief of pathology. We would nowadays really should have a chief of, uh, a departmental chief of cardiovascular disease, a departmental chief of neurosciences, of GI disease, because the service line, that is the medical, surgical, interventional people in a particular specialty, they really work very, very closely. So one of the ways, as you all know, there's tremendous pressure to reduce costs in medical care. And one of the things we do, we have a, a heart clinic where we'll have the cardiologist and the cardiac surgeons in the same clinic. So when a patient comes from upstate New York and they drive four hours to get down here to see a cardiologist and the cardiologist says, well, I think you need surgery. Why don't you make an appointment and come back? We don't do that. We have them in the same clinic. 
and the cardiologist will say, I think you need to see a surgeon about this valve problem. And then the surgeon's in the next examining room, he'll be right out to see you, because this will, A, will save money and save time and convenience uh, a heck of a lot for the patient. I think decreases costs in any of these organ system related departments, which I think can be uh, very, very uh, important and, and very cost reducing and very convenient for patients. Um, what else am I going to say here? Oh, yeah. One of the things that I have found, I travel a lot in far, the Far East. I've been in China quite a lot and, and Thailand. And it's something we adopted at the Heart Center at the Brigham, which I think relates to some of the things that you all were talking about, and that is not only prevention of complications while you're in the hospital to a patient, but also educating the patient. And that is having the family very closely associated with the patient. And we have at the Shapiro Heart Center at the Brigham, uh, we call it the best hospital room in America. It's 300 square feet is the minimum size room, but there's a bed in every room, every room, and a patient's loved one, a family member, can sleep with the patient from the day they have the, their operation to the day they go home, and this has been enormously helpful in helping uh, educate the patient, making sure the patient does the right thing, making sure the nurses do the right thing for the patient, they don't give them the wrong uh, drug or something of this nature. So I think more involvement of families in the health care of the patient is just, especially hospitalized patients, I think is, is essentially uh, a very, very important thing. And it helps the patient, it helps the doctors, it helps the nurses, and most importantly, it helps the, the very stressed out uh, uh, families. Uh, the other thing is that, again, we've got to reduce costs, and we don't want to belabor that, but everybody knows that's pretty important these days. Uh, there's tremendous pressure on all of the physicians and all the hospitals, and we want to reduce cost. But one thing I think we need to do, and this is very debatable, but I think we need to talk to all the major organizations of every specialty in the, in the, in the country, this has never been done, by the way, and sit down with the payers and say what should be and what should be not be paid for. And I think this would help a tremendous amount because unnecessary procedures the wrong procedure. There was a paper, there was an article in the Globe today, actually, on urologists doing uh, oftentimes the wrong procedure because they own the facility on which the procedure was done and they got money for it. But the, or the major organizations, the American Heart, American Cardiac, Cardiac, American Orthopedic, should sit down with the payors, government and private, some of you here, and say, this is what you should pay for and this is what you shouldn't pay for. And I had a patient about two years ago I was telling that. Uh, who had had uh, a coronary artery problem and a practitioner had put in 10 coronary stents in one artery and the patient was still symptomatic and still needed an operation. That's bad. That's just being done for money, not for the patient. So I think if we have these kind of rules and regulations uh, related to the payers and what should and should not be done, I think it would be helped to decrease a lot of costs and just do the right things. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to talk about um, patient engagement as a potential solution for a lot of the ills in healthcare because it would be so wonderful if every patient across America could have you as their physician and the Brigham. Okay, that's good. Okay, it's all set. We're going to do cloning next and we'll be all set. Um, but the complexities that patients are facing and, and all these wonderful technologies that we're working on. And my feeling is when you're in the trenches and things get tough, you have to keep your eye on simple things that are pull throughs that make things work more efficiently. So I'm going to tell you a little bit, a story about how I got there. And, and what I think I learned that can help this conversation. Um, first of all, very few of us are bigger than money, and as long as we're doing incentives that are pay, pay by procedure, we're never going to have significant change in the healthcare culture. So let's be honest about that. That stinks, but, um, but the good news is that change is coming, accountable care, and the concept behind it that we care about outcomes. Um, so that's good, and um, all of those efforts can benefit greatly from what's possible and what's not possible about patient engagement. I became a patient engagement evangelist, which is pretty much explains how, how much I try to work on it. That was after the death of my father. He entered the hospital seven years ago for a surgery on his neck, and he died six months later of complications from a hospital-acquired C. diff infection which the whole, if you know anything about that and the trajectory of that disease, it made no sense to me. And um, it opened my eyes to the question, what can the patient and family do in the healthcare setting to make a difference? 
So this spring, um, I got to answer that question, explore that question more closely than anybody wants to. Um, and that was when my 26-year-old daughter, who hiked the entire Appalachian Trail last year, 2,200 miles from Atlanta uh, to Maine, suddenly couldn't walk. Um, she was diagnosed with a rare and paralyzing nerve disorder called Guillain-Barre syndrome, or GBS. Um, hers came with crippling back pain. The paralysis starts in the arms and legs, and in one-third of patients it goes to the chest, and they can't breathe, and they have to go in a breathing tube in intensive care. And some patients die. Over the next days, um, paralysis took away most of Jess's ability to walk. Um, it impacted her swallowing, and it stole her smile. Um, despite her positive prognostic factors that she was young and healthy and that she got treatment in the right window, we were told to be realistic that it would be six months to a year before she would recover. Well, we knew, and I'd known from my work, that um, during care transitions and staff rotations, these are when things fall through the cracks. So I stayed, we stayed in her room all day and all night. We gathered research from my patient advocate network. We Googled everything. We wrote things down. And then we distilled from that what were the disconnects so that we weren't running to our medical team with sheets of research. We wanted to make sure that we were adding to their body of knowledge, or at least res respectfully asking, if we, what do you think of this? And the result was amazing. They stepped up their game. They, uh, they did more research. They asked our input when it was time to make a decision. We really, really worked as a team. But during those times when the widgets of care become the, the preoccupation, people are busy and they say things like, I'm sorry, but it's shift change, or um, that's not my job. I saw how our single-minded focus on the patient compelled them to connect with their, their innate mission. I saw this happen many times. Um, that was my daughter in the hospital. For example, one day, Jess was away from her floor, she was um, finishing up a sonogram and going to an x-ray. And she was in pain, and her pain meds were overdue. And I said, how long is it going to take because she's in a lot of pain? And the technician shrugged and didn't look up and said, it depends how long it takes for transport to get here. And the chief of radiology, who was hovering nearby, said, why don't we take her? And guess what happened? <laughs> the technician pulling up the rear of the gurney said, oh my god, I've never seen the chief of radiology move a patient before. And it was as if God was moving a patient, which is why I took the picture, because I almost couldn't believe that I saw that. Um, in that moment, of course, we were ridiculously grateful for this kind act. But then I thought, how sad that this small act would be extraordinary for being so unique. And I thought, what about the next patient that is in agonizing pain and has to wait till transport gets there? And what if you know, we weren't so lucky that this was just, just about comfort and dignity um, instead of life and death? So clearly, this points to a problem that we have. Now, I believe we can regulate, and we can uh, legislate, and we can guideline everything, behaviors, until we're blue in the face. And at the end of the day, it doesn't work. So how, besides financial, big fat financial incentives, do we compel good behavior? If you want to build a ship, don't drum up people to collect wood and don't assign them tasks and work, but rather teach them to long for the endless immensity of the sea. And how does this relate? Well, it's impossible to quantify how much our engagement and, uh, and theirs, which was significant, impacted Jess's care. But I can tell you that there's a study of GBS patients with Jess's exact treatment protocol. The average hospital stay was 23.1 days. Jess was out in seven days. And then we took over her rehab at home. And this was her <laughs> shortly after she got back. You can lower that audio, Ian, if you want. That's my husband trying to tease her. Clearly, she's having trouble. And then three weeks after it all started, I took another video of us on a bike ride. And um, in the end, Jess recovered in half the time half the minimum time the doctors insisted that it would take. A local reporter called it a miracle. Um, but I think it speaks to many things, including the earth-moving forces that are released when the medical team and the patient and family engage with their A-game. And it's at this interaction that we have magic moments, and doctors and nurses have more joy at work, because these are the outcomes we all want. Now, earlier I alluded to what isn't possible with patient engagement, and there is, in fact, a lot. Because though you can create the best 
tools and most intuitive apps and most user-friendly blue buttons, you cannot make a patient engage no way, no how. We're as individual as our fingerprints. Some, like me and Alicia, are crazy for it. Other people, no. No way. So how do you know what engagement I want or what he wants? And how do you give it, it, us each exactly that? You could simply ask us. I would happily have filled out this four question questionnaire asking about my engagement. How motivated am I? And then you would know that I'm a 10 on the motivation scale. I could be invited to be part of the patient involvement study. Or maybe you'll learn another patient is highly motivated but needs skills and resources. Now, if you also have an accountable care organization, how valuable is it to you to know about these patients? Would you be interested in serving them um, before everybody else figures that out? Just a thought. Now, there are many patients out there that are like me and want to help, if only you ask. And who knows what's possible, but I think it might be intoxicating to find out. Thank you. Thank you. So, something that always strikes me um, at events like this, I'm sure you guys feel the same, is I'm just so grateful to work in this industry and to work with people like you guys, right? Like what an incredible bunch of stories. And something that we were really trying to do with this panel today is to break down what I would consider sort of silos that often exist when we talk about what's not working and what to do differently. In that we like to sit with like-minded people and I always sort of term it like admire the problem. And what we're trying to do on this panel is what you just perfectly saw represented, which is we sort of went from very different viewpoint to very different viewpoint. You know, the reminder that behind every number is a patient, there's a story, there's a real person, the concern about labeling um, and, and how to think about that, which we'll dig into in a second. The notion that um, health is life, and when life goes bad, health goes bad. And I think the concept that we treat individuals in a way that is not the way that they would want to treat themselves and in fact forgets that at the end of the day we are whole people. And then of course the incredible stories from both of you that are a reminder that most of us don't go willingly into the healthcare system. And when we do, a whole other world begins to apply where quality matters and caregivers matter and the, the energy that you bring to your care and that your family brings to your care is so critical. So, I want to remind you guys again, if you have questions, please tweet them to either at Adrain or at Eliza Corp. And I'll just kick it off with asking a question, and let's have some fun with these paddles. So if you want to answer the question, just raise your paddle. This is open to anybody to answer. The first question um, I think was brought up by Judy, which is, do we think language is important in healthcare? For example, the term diabetic. Um, my favorite is the word patient. And I would encourage all of you, for fun, just look at the definition of patient. It includes... Um, one who is acted upon. Its synonyms are sufferer and victim. And it comes, one of its originations is a Latin for the term um, to suffer. So I want to throw that out to anyone who's interested, diabetic, patient, any of these terms that we use. Does language matter? Does it impact this divide that we're talking about, this opportunity to do a better job treating the whole person, helping with quality? Any thoughts? Yes. No. I'm going to say that one of the main things it does, I believe, is it really changes the dynamic. Because as soon as I look at myself as a patient and you're the physician, then I'm already in a position where I'm you know, needing you to fix something for me. I'm not empowered. I'm not feeling like I'm going to be part of something. I'm going to be having you do something to me. So I think that it really is something that uh, impacts the dynamic. Yep, I would agree. Other thoughts? Yes. Well, I'm a long-term patient, and my philosophy is you can call me anything you want, just don't call me late for dinner. <laughs> um, I feel as though when I'm a patient, I want you to know that I'm suffering, and I want you to know that I need you and that I'm vulnerable. So as long as you wash your hands, you give me the highest quality care that you can, it's not what you call me, it's what I answer to. Yes. I think uh, the terminology and names is extremely important. There's a whole new group of health caregivers called physician's assistants that are now working in hospitals all over the country. And these are going to be very important for the accountable care because they're going to do a lot of after the hospital work. So I think it's important to know they're not doctors, but they're patient. They're, they work with and for the doctors and they're our agents. And they're very important to give the your complaints or give the symptoms or whatever so that they can be transmitted as this is 
revolutionizing a lot of healthcare in many areas. So I think identifying with names who the people are, so there's no confusion uh, about who's who and, and, and who's saying what to whom, and it's, they're not taking the place of a nurse, yeah. but they're working as part yeah. of the team. And so things, I think these terminology things are very important in my opinion. One thing I will say as a patient though, um, I started a production company and it's called Patient 25 Productions and I do videos for patient safety. And uh, being in the hospital for two months, it's very disconcerting to have someone refer to you who's standing there and talking about you about, well, patient 25 in bed B, you know, and they're talking about you. I've been here for two months, you know me. My name is Alicia, that's Betty and Ron, my parents right there, please call me Alicia. Please refer to me as Alicia. And uh, I, now in that sense, I do have an issue because it dehumanizes the patient and it allows there to be that distance, that disconnect, that disengagement from yeah. the patient. Yeah. So while, you know, in terms of labels, oh, you're the doctor, you're the patient, I don't have a problem with that, but I do have a problem when you are referred to in a healthcare system as patient 25, well, patient 14. And I think part of what you're getting at that I think we're all getting at here is central to what we're trying to fix in healthcare overall, which is the notion of choice. Right? We should be able to choose the label that we want. And there are probably times when each of us have, have very welcomed being part of a system that is acting upon us because we are in need, because we are not at a place where we feel that we could make good decisions for ourselves. Um, but there are a lot of other times when those labels that are put on us um, can be harmful right? and, and not be how we want to project ourselves. So I think keeping that awareness as we're going into any situation about how would this person define themselves and leading with that, I think, is key. Um, a follow-up blank question is, do most physicians really think of patients as partners? Does anyone want to take that one on? As what? Do most physicians <laughs> really think of patients as partners? Mm. Pat. Maybe I should defer to my esteemed colleague first. Go ahead. If you want to say something, go ahead. <laughs> um, uh, by the way, I would say I would call her Mrs. Cole. Mrs. Cole? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, what I found is that we need to establish um, a degree of respect, um, which is very difficult for patients and families when they're in the throes of a serious situation. So when, one thing that I, I didn't mention earlier is, you know, how do we find these engaged patients? How do you find Alicia or somebody that is going to be emotionally intelligent, who is going to elevate the physicians and the team's game without being strident and needy? And I hate to say it, but that's a fear that all medical teams have is that they're going to have that needy patient. So what happens is if you get a few of us, you don't need a lot. You get a couple in your hospital and you give them the, the you vest them with the power. Hey, you know what? You sign, you give, you are 10 on our scale. Do me a favor. Call, you know, fill out this form. Can I call you later? Or even in real time, let me get feedback from you about how we're doing things. What you're going to do is up the game for everybody. And, you, and the outliers become more exposed. And they get uncomfortable eventually, and they leave. And that's yeah. how culture change can happen, using patient engagement. So once we get to that point where we have elevated the conversation, now we can start to talk about partnership yeah. and, and respect, which should be mutual. Yeah. Yes. Well, the patient, I don't call the patient a partner, I call the family a partner because I think the family can partner with the physician and the nurse and the, phys and the PA to make the patient better. The patient is the object of our work and our interest, not the partner, but occasionally there's some very, very uh, alert, bright patients that can give you some interesting information, but mostly it's from the families, which is very good. Those are the partners that I work with in dealing with the patient because they know more about the patient sometimes than the patient knows about his or herself. <laughs> and thank God. And uh, uh, we think that's very important. That's the partnership that I, that I believe in is most important, is that the patient sometimes may be so sick, they, they can't really tell you everything that's really uh, uh, pertinent. Whereas with a family, as your partner in helping take care of this, but that's why we like this situation at the Brigham where we have the patient family who sleeps in the room with the patient from the first night of cardiac surgery, that first night they're in the room, is very satisfying for the patient and it helps yeah. the healthcare providers, the nurses yeah. and the doctors 
their partner. I think I, I can imagine how much the crowd would all love to comment, right? I'm sure on the stuff that's coming out right now. Rebecca, you had. I think part of the, the challenge with the, um, the, the patient and the physician being real partners is often the fear on the part of physicians to um, ask questions of their patients when they are they don't feel confident they'll be able to act on the answers to those questions. Um, and so, you know, we'll often have um, physicians say to us, you know, like, I can't, I can't ask my patients if they're running out of food at the end of the month or, you know, if they have a refrigerator to be able to uh, refrigerate their diabetes meds because, you know, what if the answer were no? Like, what would I do about that? And at the same time, you know, what, what we see at Health Leads is we constantly have patients who come to us, you know, where, um, you know, they were just told that their child needs a nebulizer, but, you know, their, their electricity hasn't been turned on for six weeks and you know so the clinical care really becomes kind of a, a tree falling in the forest and never becomes real for the patients as a result of that. One of the questions that got tweeted is do you have the social services to address those problems that you're seeing? Yeah, I mean, what we um, have found is that there's, um, in most communities, a quite robust landscape of community resources and also public benefits. The real barrier is around um, information and connectivity and really being able to help, you know, the same way patients need navigation to be able to successfully access um, and be full partners in the healthcare system. They also need support and navigation and accessing those resources. So, you know, managing language barriers, transportation yeah. barriers, bureaucratic yeah. barriers that may arise. Okay. Um, Joan? Well, I think the other thing that's interesting think, is that yeah. so many patients uh, or consumers actually have benefits that they don't even know about that do that. So most, most companies buy EAP benefits, which have extensive local community networks by city, and everybody has a stigma of EAP, right? And, and actually, it's, it, it is, we should call it like life solutions, and it shouldn't have the stigma, oh, you're the alcoholic who got sent over there, you're the person who had an anxiety breakdown. It's really not. So I also think there's ways to help you know, consumers understand the services that they can access, take the stigma away from a lot of it. A lot of the work we've been doing on the vulnerability index with, with the LISA is, if someone's stressed, help them use the benefits that they have to maximize stress reduction so that they can then maybe focus on their health. Because while they're stressed and they don't have, you know, electricity, they're certainly not going to be focused on their diabetes. Yep. And I think, um, actually, you know, what you're saying in terms of you have a few social workers in your office, um, this whole thing of the team across the continuum, uh, wouldn't it be great to really be able to engage all of those community resources to be part of the team rather than to have a social worker in your team that's referring to them? So it's, it's connectivity, yes, but it's also really rethinking the community and what those resources are and how we utilize them. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that completely. Um, when I left the hospital, uh, and, and I think this is an area for opportunity at the discharge planning, and we know that discharge is becoming increasingly important because of readmissions. Um, when I left my hospital with an open abdomen that stayed that way for three years and I asked for help, is there a support group, is there something, they gave me cancer survivor information. And yes, you know, I had nine of the strongest antibiotics on the market and two types of chemo, but I wasn't a cancer patient, so it wasn't the same type of support system. So I became an engaged patient and an advocate for myself in trying to find those kinds of resources. And when I do patient advocacy and, and workshops for patients, I let them know there are, there are community resources like Independent Skill Centers of America yeah. and Independent Living Centers of America. and. I think we need to re-educate our um, discharge planners and our, our hospital-based um, social workers to think outside of the box because yep. so many times they're just giving you standard. Well, and let's, yeah, I think that's know. true. And one other thing I'll add quickly and then we'll go to another question so we can keep moving is, you know, it's when people are in need, we're talking a lot right now people who come to the system because something happens to them and so they need help. And when they come to the system, then we need to broaden our definition of health to include these other factors and address them. But I think as importantly, all of us have to remember that people who are in need often don't have the capacity to ask for help. And so it's really important as we're designing programs to go out into the community virtually, physically, and get a hold of these people and let them know that this stuff exists because otherwise they might not ask for it. I want to ask a question that might be controversial. David, you um, got at it before. Do you think folks who are not hitting health metrics like BMI or blood pressure or who may be smoking um, should have to pay more? Anyone want to take that? 
hot question. Joan? Well, actually, the PAPACA healthcare reform legislation is enacting incentive designs for just that, right? So on the consumer side of it, now it will depend upon whether employers actually activate it, but in the legislation going live 2014, 30% of your employee paid contribution can be tied to um, clinical outcomes measures improvements like blood sugar reduction, um, you know, hypertension, cholesterol, weight management, body mass index, smoking, they put it actually a 20% on yeah. smoking. So, um, and I think what you're gonna see, and you can actually take up to 50% of the contribution tied to process measures. So, the in so yeah, whether we agree or not, the intent of PAPACA is to hold the consumer accountable, hold the physician accountable through an accountable care structure and pay for value and have active, you know, you know, in active patients yeah. involved. And if they aren't, that they will probably pay more. Yeah. Anyone else want to take that? Well, yeah, I, I, I tend to, I, I know where you're coming from, but a lot of people that signed up for health insurance the first time, they might be smoking, they might be overweight and this and that. They've never been told properly not to do those things. I mean, I, I have a, a friend as a cab driver that I go with to the airport every now and then, and I told him, why are you smoking? I said, well, no one ever told me not to smoke. I mean, I don't think there's enough of this kind of thing from the payers and from the primary care and the doctors of all kinds, how horribly destructive smoking cigarettes are. And it just should be told. But I think the first time people sign up for insurance, oftentimes they really don't understand how risky these factors are. I'm going to, I'm going to poll the audience quickly. Do you guys agree with that? Do you think the average person knows how dangerous it is to smoke? Raise your hand if you think so. I think that's it. that would be a, an interesting debate to get into just in and of its own, right? What is the awareness of health risk? Pat, what are you thinking? Well, I just think, you know, in line of um, some of the clients that maybe Rebecca sees um, in her organization, um, I'm very privileged that I went to schools and had a family culture where I, knew, I know the connection um, between lifestyle and some of these health problems, these chronic health problems. And it's very easy for me to, to say, you know, I mean, my mother's a smoker and I don't judge anybody for it, but a lot of families never either had um, role models, they don't, they're not taught in school, or they don't have fresh food in the grocery store in their inner city. And so I think we need to switch the whole accountability model where at, at every level, that kid in grade school, because school is where we can capture most kids. Why do we teach them about STDs when they're 11 years old, um, when they're much more likely to die of getting in a, you know, in a bike accident and having an infection and dying? So mm -hmm. we need to teach health literacy, I think, in the schools and have this, this overview where the accountability is built into the fabric of all of our infrastructures. And that way, um, we're not, you know, it's not a surprise when you're 26 signing up for your first health plan. Yeah. Yes. Well, uh, just to go on, on the other <laughs> Yay. Nobody clapped for me. That's for you. <laughs> <laughs> Once having told them that, then when they come back for, you know, for sign up for the next year, they better be off the cigarettes and weight reduction, or they will. I do believe they should be penalized. Yeah, Rebecca? And then I'm going to ask one more question quickly, which will go, because I think we're basically out of time. So we'll go fast on the last one. Yeah, but I think, you know, we, we often encounter the classic, um, you know, the doctor says to the patient, your daughter's at risk of um, becoming obese. She should eat healthy and exercise more. And that's kind of the entire conversation. And then the patient will come to us and say, um, you know, I'm running out of food at the end of the month. And, you know, so I think the question is sort of how do you... Um, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation has this great language around how do you make the right choices easier. So a lot of our question is, you know, can you make connections to these resources that patients need in order to be able to really assume responsibility for their health as routinized as any other subspecialty referral? So, you know, you can refer them to the cardiologist, you can also refer them to the exercise program, and those things should be equally seamless within the system. Okay. Um, one last quick topic. I'm so glad that this slide is up here. Pat, you just worked your magic to make that happen. Thank you. So something that I think is really interesting, I've been at a lot of conferences in the last couple of months, is how infrequently we talk about end of life and advanced care. And you're looking at an area that both really matters to all of us as humans, right, to do that end of the life and death continuum better, and a place where, for the most part, we don't do well, and there's a lot of cost associated with that. 70% of people want to die at home, only 30% do. I want to ask you guys really quickly, if you just run down the line, 
when is the right time to start having that conversation and whose responsibility is it to start having it and any fast tips, you can answer any part of this, that you have that we as a country can just start doing this foundationally better. You want to go first? Yeah? Me? Yes. Um, well, I love this slide, and uh, in full disclosure, this is a project that Alex Strain has brought about. It's called Engage with Grace, and it's five questions on one slide that we're all invited to put at the end of our presentations to prompt the conversation. We need easy ways and, and you know, ways that are out there in the ether that people, oh yeah, I heard about that. So when you bring it up, hopefully not at a critical time, but it is not painful. Um, we had a wonderful conversation with somebody uh, who is doing videos, so because a video is so of a person expressing their wishes is such a conversation stopper for all the siblings that might be arguing of what did mom really want. But this tool I love because it is easy to implement no matter what your venue and and we need to talk about it because as long as medicine is incentivized to keep us in that bed and we die in the unfamiliar surroundings away from everything that's comforting and it shouldn't be that way. That last mile should be a beautiful thing. Yeah, thank so I you. thank you for the work that you've done to thank bring you, that. Thank to you, Pat, and thank you for, for, for raising that. Thank you. Joan? So I agree with Pat. I think actually we need to start health literacy when children are extremely small. I mean, I've been in healthcare for 20 years from I ran a diabetic company, and I took the kids to see what the drugs were and, and how this distribution and, and taught them about what, how you get diabetes. And they have a lot better understanding for nutrition and exercise. And I think if we don't start educating kids about what it means to truly be healthy, what a proper plate is, and then take it throughout life, right? On the other side of life, as you know, my, my five years ago, well, a year ago, I had this conversation with my parents and we've been having it for 10 years and they just last week moved to Florida so we can set up an entire system for them to be able to take care of them. And we did this, this discussion together that we're taking to the medical community um, and we found the proper medical community to administer it. So I think it needs to go multi-generational. It needs to start when children are young yeah. and it needs to Great be point. a not a taboo in, in, your, in your family. Yeah. Um, and I think it needs to be not be a taboo in the medical communities either, right? Yeah. I think it needs yeah. to be an open discussion. Yeah, I love that. Yeah. Who else? No, um, I totally agree. Uh, I actually had the experience with my family that uh, my father was a minister and he started talking about these subjects very early on and when we would even talk about news and current events and things like that, we always talked about, you know, how, how did we feel about that? So we have to demystify it and, and really have it, as you said, not taboo, not uncomfortable and not something you do when it's in a crisis mode. You need it, exactly. Yep. Yep. Absolutely, because I think, especially, um, I, I think it's something that should start well before an event or an illness, but in the event that you do have an acute illness or if you're just going into a facility for an elective procedure, in light of what we know about the chances for medical harm, I think at that point you definitely need to have that conversation with your loved one. Who's going to be there to assist you in the facility, to help you, um, and to let your providers know that that person can listen in to discussions and, and you are waiving that HIPAA privilege yeah. with your loved ones, and then what do you want uh, in terms of end of life care and, and heroics in, in the event that something should happen. So if it's not a discussion that you've already had with your family, um, definitely before you have any kind of procedure done. Well, and I, I just add to that quickly that something for all of us to remember is not only do we need to have this conversation with our family members, but then we have to commit to standing up for them and what they wanted and you know, making sure that their wishes are honored because the system often doesn't know how to do less. And if that's what somebody's wishes are, someone's going to have to advocate. I'm going to if there any, aren't any other closing comments, thank this panel. You guys are extraordinary. And then tell the audience, because I'm sure you all have a ton more questions for them. I know that I do, that the Global Health Delivery Project at Harvard has actually been working with Dr. Joe Cavadar and his team at the Connected Health Symposium to host a one-week web discussion with select speakers and experts. I know, for example, Pat, that you're going to be part of this. The panel starts next Monday. You can sign up now. It's free. Go to ghdonline.org. So it would be great if you could go sign up, join this conversation, throw a lot more questions at the people who are there. The speakers are going to discuss patient perspective, how we can leverage technology to improve the delivery of healthcare, and the relationships with doctors, as well as what IT solutions are being developed for health providers and clinicians. So big round of applause for the wait, best wait, panel. Wait, yes. wait, 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 wait a minute. Uh, wait a minute. There's one other thing. If uh, Alex could take just a minute or two as a public service announcement and 
tell you about her work with the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care. It just seems relevant to me. Oh, that would be great. Okay. Thank you. So um, there is, I think, an increasing sense, maybe because of the silver tsunami, maybe because so many of us have had experiences that didn't go well at at end of life for a loved one, that this is something that we need to fix. Incentives are changing. More and more organizations are getting behind. Maybe it's OK to start talking about this stuff. Maybe some of the taboos are going away. So there's a group called the Coalition to Transform Advanced Care, which Joe is a part of. Thank you. Um, Joan is a part of. I'm a part of. We invite all of you guys to join. It's basically um, sort of a big tent. And our philosophy going into it was if we're all together under this tent, then nobody will feel isolated for beginning to really push this notion that we have to start having this conversation as a country. And we have to have the conversation early and often because our answers will change. In addition, we have to start understanding what best practices are and how do you care for someone who's in an advanced care situation. So the organizations that are part of CTAC include um, big health plans, big integrated delivery systems, big employers, big patient advocacy groups like AARP, big associations like the American Hospital Association or the American Cancer Society. And there's a lot of information. There's a website that's launching soon. Um, if you just Google CTAC and keep an eye on it, you'll be able to track it. And the notion is to deliver resources really across the country to let individuals who are patients, let individuals who are caregivers, let individuals who are practicing physicians or financial assistants, um, uh, financial recommend the folks who work professionally in the financial services world to give them all tools to help do this better because I think increasingly um, this will become a reality for all of us that we all know we could do so much better. So, Joe, thank you very much for letting so, us. So, one other thing I would like to ask Alex if she would be willing to provide uh, a summary paragraph or something like that, we will get it out. Uh, to all of you. I know you have an event coming up in November. Yeah, we do. I'm happy okay. to do that. Thank you. Thank Wonderful you so panel. Much. Thank you.